Africa. The head projectors taught me how to lace up, rewind, and film cement smelled like pear drops. But it was just the family business, and it didn't seem unusual. I've always wanted to see the frontier. You didn't want to see the frontier? Yes, sir. Before it's gone. I think he's scored some of the great movies of the last 30 years and some of the movies that are the most famous of the last 30 years. If you think in terms of the 60s as a revolution in England, it was music-led, and the Beatles led the rock and roll, and, and John led the movie music. He's led the way in showing other people how to do it. He showed me how to do it. Come on. A big welcome, please. Our guest, special guest here, John Barry. A winner of five Oscars, John Barry is the most successful movie score composer of the 20th century. Yet this very private man prefers to let his music speak for him, work that embraces deep emotion and high drama. It's an island with just a causeway. It's very private. It's only 45 miles from New York. People don't believe it when they say, oh, we're going to come and see you in New York, and they arrive here. They don't, they don't get it at all. It's, it's just idyllic. There's no traffic here, only the boats and the Oyster Bay train across there, but that's it. And so any day of the week, it's, it's like a Sunday. It's, it's perfect. It's just the way you get things done as a composer. Just to have 24 hours a day without conversations with anybody and without any interruption at all. Just so you're free to think and then relax and just go on the beach and reflect, come back and start writing. I always wanted to write music for film. I found the dramatic thing very easy. I, I never worried when I saw a movie. I never really had a big problem worrying what I was going to do about it, because I, I was born in my father's theatres. I was brought up watching movies, you know, every day of the week. OK, John Patrick. My son has seen Born Free, and he loves it. He sees the Bond movies. He loves the Bond movies, you know. OK, let's go down to the boat. I've done about 140 movies. So there's this whole celluloid world out there forever, you know. I have the good fortune to enjoy America and New York very much. I guess probably 80, nearly 90% of New Yorkers are all from some other place with first or second generation memories of where they came from. It's a wonderful cosmopolitan melting pot and I love it.
When I come home to York, it really is coming home. York was a very, very singularly beautiful city. I mean, a lot's changed, there's a lot of things happened to it. But um, the whole centre of town, the shambles and Peter Gate, it had a great charm to it, great charm. John Barry Prindergast, the youngest of three children, was born in York in 1933. His mother was a classical pianist and his father owned a chain of cinemas. The young Barry developed an early love for the cinema. My father, John Xavier Prendergast, he was Irish. Started as a projectionist, actually, in the silent movies. Worked up to being the manager of the Palladium Lancaster. And then he came to York and bought his first cinema. And then finally wound up with a, a chain of, like, eight independent theatres in the north of England. So I was just brought up in the cinema. I mean, that was it. This is the cinema my father built in 19, beginning of the 1930s. I virtually lived here. It's strange because there's certain things that are still there, the exit doors and... Yeah, it was, it was a cinema, but it was also a concert hall. You know, and of course, all this has changed, all the staging area here. Mm. I mean, when you think of the artists that, that appeared here, from the Nat King Cole trio, the Ink Spots. If I knew that when I... All the big bands, Stan Kettner's orchestra. Gracie Fields. I guess she was like everybody's mother, and all these troops were away from their parents and their families, and they were all here. And I think everybody reflected there was their mum on stage. I remember my father walking me in downstairs in the stalls, and it was black and there was a barrier across. And he picked me up, and there's this big black and white mouse on the screen. And it seemed huge, I mean, you know, just seeing this big black and white mouse on the screen and thinking, strange, my dad has this place that they show black and white mice on the screen. We used to come and sit. Um, just actually, just like the back row here. I used to come every afternoon from being maybe six, seven, or eight years old. I just loved cinema. I love music anyway, but I started really taking great note of film music and the Max Steiners and Bernard Hermans and Miklos Rocher, and I became fascinated with film music. He was a very, very strict father. He always thought we should know as much as he did. So if we did something wrong or whatever, he'd scream. I don't know, I think he must have been in this building somewhere. And he was talking to some people about me. And I, 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 stood, I was going to come around the corner and I, and I stopped and I heard him. And he was saying how bright I was, how I did this, how I did it, all like that. He never talked to me like that. And I let him finish. And then I just walked past us. Evening, Dad. <laughs> I walked out, gave him a bit of his own back. He was, he was almost embarrassed that he'd been caught being nice, you know, it's very funny. And it, people adored him, they were very fond of him. Because he was nice to everybody else outside the family. It's one of those Irish things, you know. Everybody else is uh, terrific, but your own kind of, you can stick. 
In 1953, Barry did his national service. While some played war games, he played trumpet in the army band. And with the help of a correspondence course, he also learned to arrange jazz. When I came out of the army when I was about 22, I don't remember a part of my life prior to that where it hadn't been one of, of, of discipline of one sort or another. And so when I started my group and got out on my own, it was like, God, I flew like a bird. I found three musicians that I'd been in the army with and uh, three local musicians in Yorkshire. So we formed the first seven. Let's go over to the bandstand where the John Barry Seven are all set to rock and roll their way through a number called You've Got Away. Take it, boys. Up, Tom. You the got away that I need so much. You the got away with your love. Rock and roll, it was all Gene Vincent and all these. Yeah, yeah, boy, boy. Yeah. And I can rally him. Oh, yeah, yeah. No. And, it, and of course, it doesn't carry. Right, you are my lad. You got me away. Well, it's not that I didn't like singing, it's that nobody else liked the way I sang. It was as simple as that. Now, since I met you. It was really uh, not a good idea. So we quickly switched to just doing instrumental stuff. And so I got this call from John saying, uh, would I like to join his band? Because the guitar players couldn't read. And he knew, knew that I could read the guitar, read the music on the guitar. So he said, if you come in, uh, that, that would be great. Most of the songs we played all featured the guitar. Walk, Don't Run. Black Stockings. The Hit and Miss. Pancho. The turning point for the John Barry Seven was drumbeat. Every Saturday night, it was kind of the top show, and anybody who was on it became a star uh, or famous. You know, we used to go out and do concerts, and of course, you know, with the John Barry Seven, you know, ooh, screaming all the time. Fans around the stage door <laughs> used to come out and they say, Excuse me, are you famous? <laughs> Jack Good had a, a boy on the other channel and he had Cliff Richard. And the BBC wanted to know, Did I know anybody else who we could have? And I said, The one person who I think has a great personality, he can't sing for hell, but he's very photogenic, and that's Adam Faith. I suddenly get this call. Uh, from John Barry to the cutting rooms at Elstree, where I was. And he said, we're doing a new show called Drumbeat. Do you want to come along and have a go? And I said, look, do this, do a couple of them, let, do an audition, and let's see. I said, but don't give up your day job yet. I got six months on that Drumbeat show, and I honestly, I can tell you that it would not have happened without John, because John insisted to Stuart Morris, the producer, that I should be one of the regulars. I always looked at John as the older generation, like a dad. He looked after me like a dad. In the studios, he looked after me. I had no knowledge. I don't think John had that much knowledge either, but he had a confidence about him, and it was born of a confidence in his own talent. I was in the corridor one day on a Saturday, and he came running up. He said, quick, come, come into the studio. Yes, I think I found a hit. What do you want if you don't want money? What do you want if you don't want gold? Say what you want and I'll give it to you. When we were recording it and I sang it the first time, they screamed and shouted at John. He can't sing it like that. It sounds like it comes from China. And John absolutely would not allow any interference in what him and I were doing. Oh, well, then you want my love, baby. I think we wound up with about eight or nine consecutive 
top 10 hits. Well, I still go to the dance hall, listen to the noise. I try to kid myself, I'm having fun there with the boys. Oh, yes, I did. What you told me. Adam Hood always wanted to act. Then he got his first break from a producer called George Willoughby, who was making a, a movie called Beat Girl, which was about the English beatnik life in Soho at the time. John and I were managed by the same horrendous woman, Eve Taylor. But one thing she did, she knew how to leverage one artist against another. And when I got Beat Girl as a movie, the first instinct for her was, who's doing the music? I want John Barry to do the music. You want to pay me now? More action, let's talk. I think that film probably was more major for John's new career as a film writer than it was for me. I just sort of did it as a laugh. To... I was loving acting. But for John, it was, a, it was the path split at that point from pop music into film. A major break came for Barry when he was asked to arrange Monty Norman's title music for the very first Bond movie. About to finish production, the producers were under pressure to complete on time. By the Thursday of the following week, I was in the studio with the seven, plus the full orchestra. I never saw the movie, I never met Salzman and Broccoli, I never met the director, I never even read a script. I just knew of Bond, I think it was in the Daily Mail. There was a, a strip of Bond, which I'd occasionally looked at. Uh, so I knew what it was about. by Dwayne Eddy, who was a wonderful guitarist out of, uh, of America, who'd done an, an album, I think, called The Twang's The Thang. And he did a lot of that, that low down, dirty kind of uh, guitar thing. The guitar was very much featured with the, with the John Barry 7 anyway. But we wanted a more dynamic, more percussive sound than we'd been getting. And it was kind of an unusual record, really, because it started off like that. Then it went into a whole big swing jazz kind of, like, almost Dizzy Gillespie bebop do da 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 do da I think once they heard what John could do, um, you know, they felt that that was the right sound, that he was very contemporary. This was a new type of movie, and they needed to have a very contemporary um, sound. The actual scoring of that high brass, you know, and I've seen the score and it's very clever. I mean, John actually writes the trumpets quite high to make that tremendous crack. Everything came together in Goldfinger. It was like they'd been learning themselves, and when it came to Goldfinger, they'd got the whole style down, and everything else that went on after that, Goldfinger was the blueprint. Goldfinger was a gold album. You know, Goldfinger hit the charts internationally. John, you know, had written the song. John had also brought Shirley Bassey into the equation. I said, Shirley, just sing it. Don't, don't, don't think about it too much. Just go out there and belt the hell out of it. And that's what she did. Gold finger. He's 
He's a man, the man with the Midas touch. A spider. With that voice <laughs> and that music, you know, it certainly told people, wow, this is going to be an experience. I think everybody who saw the, the Bond films to begin with were knocked sideways by the, not just the film itself, but the music. I mean, the music was terrific. He's always a character who has to appear calm and cool and collected. So it's really the way that the audience can get an insight into Bond's emotions is through the music. John was part of the DNA of the James Bond films. If you don't have the right music when you're going through an action sequence, you don't know you know, it, it's the thing that, that takes you through and says, OK, this is now the moment. I've got to do something really dangerous. And John was really great at creating enormous tension in scenes. The Bond movie is action. He walks in, he takes a look, he hits somebody in the face. It is Mickey Mouse, what we call Mickey Mousing it. It goes with the action. It was a big canvas, a million dollar Mickey Mouse music. But it was very, very highly disciplined writing. Bon appetit. He always runs while others walk. Writing lyrics for John Barry, it's not as simple as just making the words fit. John is very much aware of the mood of the song. And uh, although the lyrics have to follow the contours and curves of his melody, he's very much aware of the mood. The same as he searches for a mood for a movie, he wants the words not just to fit, but to cover that same landscape as he has covered. You To this day, when people sit in the audience, when they hear that sound, which is the John Barry sound, they start to tingle. Diamonds are forever. They are all I need to please me. I remember very, very well when we uh, wrote Diamonds Are Forever, and we were very, very pleased with they it. Won't believe in the night. I remember saying to Don, just let's treat a diamond like it's a man's penis. Hold one up and then caress it. Touch it, stroke it and undress it. Harry Saltzman said, how can you write words like touch it, stroke it and undress it? It's too provocative, it's filthy. And I said, but Mr Saltzman, you know. That was what was so fun about the bomb, because all that kind of innuendo and and stuff was all done in a, in, you know, in a larger-than-life kind of cartoon kind of fashion. If you think he, he wrote for the Bond, who was the big hero with the, the, the Aston Martin and all the girls and cocktails shaken but not stirred, and uh, Harry Palmer, who couldn't get a girl, wore glasses, did his own shopping, usually shook the milk to see whether it was sour or not. And John Barry had to represent that kind of a character. I use a cymbalum. It's a lovely uh, Hungarian instrument. And I just love that solo sound. In Ipcris file, you think I'm captured and taken away to some terrible, dangerous communist country in Eastern Europe somewhere. In actual fact, I was still in London, which is the whole trick of the movie. And his score helped the trick.
His music helped the plot, forwarded the plot, but never got in the way of it. As the British film industry flourished in the 60s, London started to attract American movie makers. When Carl Foreman came over to produce Born Free, he chose Barry to score it. It was a most exciting time where we were all so busy doing movie after movie and song after song and advert after advert. A face without a trace of makeup proves it. A girl's most important cosmetic is her shampoo, her sun silk. I think There's John, like me, we still couldn't believe that we were actually in the eye of the storm, that all this was happening to us. Barry never turned work down, and when he wasn't writing for movies, he also worked on television themes, mood music, and continued to run a record label. I was always a hard worker, but when I saw the way he went at it, he used to tear himself apart. It was a bit like, you know, to be an artist, you must suffer. And, but, but what happened with us is we were artists, and then we suffered, and then we went out. Of course, John was also the man about town. He had this beautiful white Citroen car, beautiful women. You know, he managed to get a lot into, uh, into his life. I don't know how he found time to write tunes anyway. No, he wasn't half as good as people talked. <laughs> he sounds a lot better in the telling. It was terrific. I mean, England opened up. It was a very healthy time to have been born into. The Lion in Winter is one of Barry's very best scores. Because it's a period piece, it demanded a specific kind of dramatic music. But because Barry chose to make it a choral score, as well as a fully symphonic score, I think surprised a lot of people in Hollywood and around the world. We had like a 120-piece orchestra and choir, and a 40-piece choir. And it was a great opportunity for me to do a choral, because I'd started off studying with Dr. Francis Jackson at York Mints, and I'd studied choral music with him. Francis Jackson was the only teacher in York. He'd written a couple of symphonies himself. He was a master of music at York Mints. And I asked him if he'd teach me, you know, the rudiments of a harmony and counterpoint. He taught organ and he taught piano, but he never actually taught musical theory. So he said, oh, that might be amusing. It's always difficult to assess the potentialities of a pupil, but I was pretty certain with, with John that he was uh, dedicated enough. Uh, he, he never said very much, so I couldn't really tell what was going on between those years. I wasn't crazy about teachers, you know, <laughs> a basic dislike for teachers so yeah. and, and and you were kind of extraordinary um in your yeah. attitude you might not know that but you, compared well, you with me. well you were you were you were very um um uh, very uh, understanding and um unhelpful believe it or not i mean it was it was a it, it was a, a different teaching ambiance that than i'd ever ever experienced before most certainly. Really? Yes, absolutely. Oh, mm -hmm. that, well, that's a comfort because... <laughs> After all these years. I must confess I've never seen any of the films which he's written for, but I've heard the music by other means, and I'm astonished at his facility with melody and the way that uh, he's orchestrated everything. I must say I'm bowled over by the way you write for an orchestra. Mm -hmm. The way you use the horns high mm -hmm. up right. in unison. It's right. a wonderful effect. It's very powerful. There's a lovely low flute. Alto flutes I like. Yes. Alto flutes. But you either use one 
or four. I have to get four out of those loops. Two doesn't sound right. Hey, man, I'm walking here. I'm walking here. Midnight Cowboy was the first time we actually worked together. John was not only the composer of the incidental music, but uh, he was sorting out all the songs from scratch, you know, that we were using uh, as if heard on the radio or whatever. You've got to hit it straight away so that you evoke a mood or a feeling for the audience. Everybody's talking at me. John did a tremendous job of arranging everybody's talking into different lengths and different introductions and whether we should go straight into the lyrics sung by Harry Nilsson. There were various demands made of him to get it just right. Everybody's talking at me. Everybody's talking at me, can't hear a word they're saying, only the echoes of my mind. The lyric had a sort of sense of energy and poetry about it. I would say if I have to pick an image for the film, it's neon. I wanted the smell of the place to be caught. But I think that the music very aptly caught the atmosphere of what we wanted. But then I wrote the harmonica theme, which didn't come in until like halfway through the movie. Getting the atmosphere was really simple, and John captured it so much in the movie. It was New York. I mean, it was just, it was, it was the, the underbelly of New York, and those characters just walked around those streets. And uh, it was there. I had people say, what's this guy down Limey doing this, such an American thing, you know? Uh, that, that didn't worry me. Certainly, I think the end of the film owes a great deal to John's theme when Razzo Rizzo has died, John Voigt is supporting the, the dead body of Razzo Rizzo. I think the fact that Barry was a Britisher gave him a kind of objectivity afforded him a chance to look at America as it was and see it as an outsider would. And I think that that, uh, while not the same choice every filmmaker would have made, I think helped to make Midnight Cowboy um, the uh, success it was. As Barry's reputation grew in the 70s, he could choose which directors to work with. Some collaborations were very successful, like those with Vim Vendors and Francis Ford Coppola. In other movies, his music was to prove even more memorable than the story. We have all the time in the world that I wrote for Her Majesty's Secret Service. It was probably the least successful James Bond song uh, at that period of time. And, uh, and then several years later, it's on a Guinness commercial in London, and the very same Louis Armstrong record went to number one in England. It was a huge success. We have on the time in the world. Diamond of I didn't know exactly who John Barry was. I knew he did a lot of the early Bond movies. But as years went by, I found myself uh, on occasion um, using uh, his film music from other pictures as a temporary track in the editing room. Finally, on Out of Africa, I began to notice that I was using more and more temporary pieces from John's music, from Robin and Mary and from Somewhere in Time, from many of his films. And by the time I got done with, with it, I thought, I, I think I'm going to finally have to hire John Barry. The 
Sydney. When he was cutting the movie, I tried all kinds of African music, you know, records of previous African movies and whatever. The first thing he said to me, he said, I I've put African music all over this thing. And he said, do you know what? He said, it doesn't work. And then when I saw the movie, I said, well, the music and the nature of African music is not going to deal with the relationship between Redford and Street and how they feel about Africa. It gave the picture more size than it really had. It gave the picture some kind of real romantic resonance in all of the relationships. He did a film called The Last Valley that I never saw. Uh, I think very few people saw. But there was a particular cue in it that I used as a temp score for a section of the film where Robert Redford takes Meryl Streep flying over Africa. And it's kind of a religious cue, and it gets a lot of its feeling because there are deep male bass voices. So I really wanted John to find a way of doing a new piece that had that same church-like feeling. You just go through a whole dramatic searching before you even put pen to paper. You don't just sit down. You, you just analyze everything, the drama, his relationship with the woman in the movie. Then you start to write the music, which hopefully is something that dramatically pulls all that stuff together. I think John found a wonderful way to be unashamed of the emotion, but controlled so that it never got into this sort of emotional bloodbath of self-pity or anything. When I write scores, if, if there is that sense of loss, and now in Africa there was, you bring your own sense of loss. It wasn't loss of a country, it was loss of friends and, and um, just the whole atmosphere of World War II that one lived through. That uh, You recall that and bring it to things. And, uh, you know, five years is a long time at that age to live through a war. New York was a very big military town. And it was pretty indiscriminate bombing. The whole sky was like just one ball of red from the bombing, from the city burning. I guess I was about nine or 10 when that happened. And I remember the following day, my mother taking me into the center of the city. And it's a stench you'll never forget in your life. You talk about burning bodies, and it's, it's just different from anything else. It, it, it just, uh, there's no way that doesn't imprint deeply on you for the rest of your life, no way. Dances was most certainly a story of the loss of the West. One of the great lines in the movie, the, when they the captain says to him, you know, why are you going out there? Do you want to see the frontier? Yes, sir. Before it's gone. So right there was, you know, the whole 
key to the, what the movie was going to be about. You know, things that work in films are very black and white. They either work or they don't work. They don't kind of work. And that dun, da, da, dun, 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 da, da, dun. You know, you just went, like, that works. I'd been very ill. I'd been ill for two years. So dances was the first thing I wrote after I'd been out of action for two years. Music is a very personal thing. Music, I mean, probably the most personal thing of anything. <clears throat> and you can create, whereas literature gets very specific about the details, so you, you're following the specifics of, of the writer. Music doesn't have those specifics, but it, it carries the mood. One of the only crafts that a director really doesn't know how to do, you know, you, you you know you put your you put your whole self in the hands of a composer. It's like you actually give this thing to him and you say, "Can you make this better?" When I sit down and write. I can start at maybe 7 in the morning, and then I'll look at my watch at 11.30. I mean, I'm, like, exhausted, as if I physically went through something, you know. So it's, uh, it's the doing of something with passion. When John is working on a project, he has unbelievable tunnel vision. Nothing else is existing, and the rest of the universe shuts down, basically, and he goes into his rooms and he doesn't really come out until he's through, and one has to be respectful that that's where he's working. The worst thing you can do is fall in love with the first idea you get. You just go until you think you've come to the end of the thing and I've totally nailed this. You never know what's going to trigger off something. But I do have total faith in the fact that something will arise out of the dark that's going to perk you up. And you never know when that's going to happen. You know when it happens. When it happens, you know, you. oh, God, yeah, it's like, it's like a gun going off. It's like, God. I'm doing my albums now, and I did the Beyondness of Things. I'm doing another album at the moment, based on John O'Donoghue's book, Eternal Echoes. It's very much inspired by John's writings. There's a certain spirituality about it, but there's a lightness to it about it, and there's a kind of Irish whimsy to it, which is nice. I never thought you would be able to have that much fun with the priest. <laughs> It amazes me, actually, that somebody who's moved in that whole superstar world, that he has held his substance so completely, because he's in a real conversation with himself. And it's that integrity that I love. How adjacent. From reading the book, there was an instinct that I loved the way the man wrote. For instance, they believe that November means a sound of the month of the dead, but the veil was actually pulled back. It's on a place like this, they almost claim that it's... Quality, there is a huge longing for some kind of rootedness. And that's what the Eternal Echoes book about is about our yearning to belong. I find my own mental movie, my own sense of drama, whatever that might be. It is a film score. I just don't have any film. <laughs> The family name is Prendergast. They were all over the place, basically Cork. There must be something in one's background, one's spirit, that just, just connects in a strange way. It's a wonderful feeling.
John Patrick's arrival definitely has been a rebirth for John um, in the most positive way, and it has energized him. I don't think that John would have been able to write The Beyondness of Things or Eternal Echoes at another time in his life. Um, for a variety of reasons, I think, you know, he now has the security to write for himself, whatever he wants, however he wants. He is writing music that is virtually symphonic. At the same time, he's not losing the audience. Most of the great film writers of today are, in fact, writing virtually the only classical music that people hear now, because the average classical composer is writing music that isn't warm enough for people to understand or to hear very much. I do think style is important. It's certainly identifiable as his music. I like to hear a score where if it's possible to identify who's, who's written it, it's, it's, he's a composer. When I started, I, I, I mean, one year I did eight moves in one year. I don't know how the hell I did it. But uh, if now I can get just one really terrific movie a year, I'd be very happy. Now that's a cigarette butt. We don't need that. No. 